ricordare il colloquio di Napoli, che è il presidente onorario della City, istituzione italiana, quindi che ci presenta che le ombre non sono nere, nessuna ombra è nera, hanno sempre un colore. Okay, I will briefly translate what she said. Since there is an international audience today, I will present Dr. Pierluigi Pagani here with my grandfather and I will present his lecture whose title is Shadows are not black, none of them is black, they all have a color. So, we will begin. Hello. So, Ti saluto a tutti, direi che eh, io dico in italiano, avrei detto in italiano se ci fosse stato un pubblico veramente italiano, visto che c'è un pubblico cosmopolita che va dai amici dell'Uruguay ad altri, preferisco cedere la parola al Piemonte che ti presenterà la, la relazione così come l'abbiamo scritta in, in inglese in modo che sia intesa da tutti quelli che capiscono l'inglese non come me yes, that's more or less what I said before since today we have an international audience he wrote the, um, the lecture but I will read it today to you for our Uruguayan friends and all the international people that are here present today and um, the lecture of course is the same as it was in Italian only that I will read it in English so I will begin So, shadows are not black. None of them is black. It's black. They all have a color. Can I do this? Please. Sorry? Okay. That's what Renoir said once when trying to theorize the technique that characterized the revolutionary style of the painting of the Impressionists. They were looking for a more modern approach to colors, abandoning the idea that shadows were simply made up from, from a brown and black entity. Besides, this sentence is also loaded with strong metaphorical meaning. In this work, we will examine the concept of separation, mainly as a sense of loss and privation, which nevertheless drive us to a painful process of personal growth. A journey, a change in a lifestyle, an illness, the death of a beloved person, or simply the fact of changing the patterns of our lives to new ones, These are all hard, challenging, and difficult experiences. However, they can turn into productive opportunities to grow. Separation can be imposed, and even if we are aware of the fact that it is inevitable, we desperately try to remain anchored to our past and our roots, and we refuse to adapt to a new life. Or it can be a proper choice, and as such, a stronger emotional growth. Trauma originates from the fact of seeing the pillars of our past life crumbling like an ancient temple, from the fear of being deprived from our, of our life and not getting it back, and the responsibility of creating a project for a new life. Nevertheless, these are all unavoidable steps that we have to go through to grow up and to better understand ourselves. In this work, we will analyze how a separation, a trauma, a negative event can lead to individuals to fall into depression. We will see how uh, depression is a detachment from reality, a separation from life itself. We will see how individual psychology, through the process of compensation, can help individuals to turn those negative events into fruitful opportunities for growth. In the parlance of painters, compensation add a splash of colors to the black shadows. So, since the beginning of 2000, feelings such as uncertainty and confusion seem to characterize our lives, making human beings prone to pessimism and dissatisfaction. Uncertainty about the future leads to uneasiness and anxiety, but also to indifference. The latter seems to be more and more spreading in a society which does not know what the future will hold. The future seems to be shrouded with a fatalistic fog. It's like walking in the darkness, but maybe it's not exactly like this. It is natural at comparison with Adlerian thought. In individual psychology, human beings are slowed down by negative environmental influence, but they always try to overcome the obstacles while elaborating a compensation, which can be either active or passive, 
positive or negative, but nevertheless represents an attempt to fight against those seemingly objective realities. Jean-Paul Sartre, the French existentialist philosopher, perceived things in general as unavoidable to men, and man who lives among them is a prisoner of an inconsistent freedom. He is often defined as a pessimistic nihilist, as one who has no faith in anything but accept his pessimists quietly. This gloomy philosophy is quite scaring as it promotes action as useless. As a junior lecturer at Lycée du Léaf, Sartre wrote the novel La Nausée, which serves in some way as a manifesto of existentialist and remains one of his most famous books. The novel concerns a dejected researcher in a town similar to Le Havre who becomes starkly conscious of the fact that inanimate objects and situations remain absolutely indifferent to his existence. As such, they show themselves to be resistant to whatever significance human consciousness might perceive in them. And it is precisely this indifference of things themselves that characterizes thought. Sire theory has not remained confined to simple doctrine, as it happened in other philosophies, but it influenced and characterized, at least for a certain period of time, some sectors of society. Clearly, the human condition of this kind leads to anti-vitalistic escapes, such as drugs, to cite an example. Nowadays, the societies which are directly influenced by Sartre have disappeared, but future generations bear the burden of his heritage. The Sargent philosophy has paradoxically given birth to an effect which is charged with positive as aspects, a sort of redemption of the thinker and his followers, which is called the existential psychotherapy. Existential psychotherapy is a philosophical method of therapy that operates on the belief that inner conflict within a person is due to that individual's confrontation with the givens of existence. These givens are the inevitability of death, freedom, and its attendant responsibility, existential isolation, and finally, meaningless. These four givens are also referred to as ultimate concerns, form the body of existential psychotherapy, and compose the framework in which a therapist conceptualizes a client's problem in order to develop a method of treatment. This combination of theory and practice has expressed strong overcoming of Freudian principles, which were dominant at the beginning. It converges, for example, in individual psychology in denying the subdivision of the mind in three areas, but it clashes in assessing its entirety. What remains is the analogy with Adler's theory when the existential psychotherapy proposes a study of the human mind, which is not confined to the conventional depths of so divided unconscious, but it extends to the style of the individual, both with the hidden meanings and its conscientious behaviors. Let's see some examples. Let's consider painting. The visual perception of the artistic representation, which is materialized in the painting, has for sure an aesthetic beauty, which seems to contrast with the message of depression that they want to convey. Every painting, whatever its representation, always pleases the senses. Nevertheless, painting is also a means of communication between the, audience, the artist and its audience, and it is a dramatic <coughs> mirror of the psychology of the painter himself. When looking at the, paint, at the painting, we are inevitably dry in a feeling of depression. The direct representation of human being is probably the simplest way to which the painter transmits his feelings. It is a timeless semantic tool which transcends artistic, stylistic, and conceptual facts, which have characterized some historical periods. Despair, for example, can be present on the face of a religious or epic subject in a naturalistic painting or in those subjective interpretation of the modern and contemporary painting. The first example which comes to mind is the screen by Edward Moore, which shows an agonized figure against a blood red sky. The scene that is depicted represents the real experience of the artist's life when he was walking with two friends in Oslo. We can clearly see the two friends in the back. They are walking away and they seem indifferent to the feelings of the friend. The face of the man reminds the skull and the mouth clearly makes us think that he is indeed screaming. Munch's work can be seen as a self-portrait. Munch develops a psychologically charged and expressive style to transmit emotional sensation. This painting is a metaphor of the agonized despair and mystery that characterizes the life of the Norwegian painter. 
The main figure is in a vast open space and feels overwhelmed. The agonized despair chills the soul, signifying a misery which is so intense that the sky seems to splinter in a lurid shards before it. And yet, it speaks to us all. That's what he said. I was, I was out walking with two friends. The sun began to set, and I felt a breath of melancholy. Suddenly, the sky turned blood red. I paused, deadly tired, and leaned on a fence, looking out across the flaming clouds over the blue-black, pure and town. My friends were on, and there I still stood, trembling with fear, and I sensed a great, infinite scream run through nature. The mule who materialized in this work is a restless innovator whose personal tragedy, sickness, and failures fed his creative work. My fear of life is necessary to me, as my illness, he once wrote. Without anxiety and illness, I am a ship without a shepherd. My sufferings are part of myself and my heart. They are indistinguishable for me, and their destruction could destroy my heart. You believe that a painter mustn't merely transcribe external reality, but should record the input a remember scene had on his own sensibility. The use of the light, the quality of the colors, clearly makes us think that the despair that is felt by someone who has gone through a strong trauma. Mung also tries to transmit the impossibility of man to react to the forces of nature, and the loneliness in dealing with circumstances as testify the friends who leave him alone. Another example can be found in the painting L'Absent by Degas. Painting in the 1875, it depicts two figures, a woman and a man, who sit in the center and right of the painting, respectively. The painting is a representation of the increasing social isolation in Paris during its stage of rapid growth. It depicts a man and a woman. In a cafe, fashionable meeting place, a man and a woman, although sitting side by side, are locked in silent isolation. Their eyes are empty and set, with drooping feature and a general air of desolation. The man, wearing a hat, looks right of the canvas, while the woman, dressed formally, also wearing a hat, stares vacantly downward. A glass filled with eponymous greenish liquid sits before her. Although there is no contact between them, the woman stares slightly before her. Her arms slack at her sides not seemingly unaware of the glass of the accent that provides the title of the painting. While the man turns to the woman, looking beyond the right border of the painting, the two figures appear to be a bit of the café. They have come to drink, and the absent is deadly, and find some solace to their mutual loneliness and despair. The realistic dimension is fragrant. The café has been identified, it is at La Nouvelle Latin and Place Pigalle, a meeting place for modern artists and a hotbed of intellectual women. We'll now look at another example which is taken from literature instead. The Italian writer Alberto Moravia is a represent representative of the category of scholars who characterize our period for what concerns style, politics, the awakening of feelings and affectivity. In this poetry, he tries to inhibit and destroy every affection, passion, even pleasure. But to deprive human beings from perceptions means to neutralize every compensation in the moments of sadness, loneliness, separation, which inevitably are part of our lives. Here we're not trying to make any literary criticism, but to present some statement and to analyze them in their psychological and physi physiological sense only. We will present a passage taken from the book La Noia, Bordeaux. This book was published in 1960 and is one of the famous novels of Alberto Moravia. Mm -hmm. It is a story of a troubled sexual relationship between a young rich painter striving to find sense in his life and an easygoing girl in Rome. Moral aridity, the hypocrisy of contemporary life, and the substantial incapability of people in finding happiness in traditional ways such as love and marriage are the main themes in the work of Alberto Moravia. This passage is the proof of how, according to Alberto Moravia, objects are just inanimate things, cold, distant, unable to give any kind of satisfaction. Moravia's poetry reflects the disillusionment and sense of inadequacy that afflicts much of our society in the current period. So now, after having applied the roots of the pressure in our contemporary culture, our research question will be, does an antidepressive culture exist? 
unfortunately, the answer can be fully satisfying. Those behaviors, as outlined above in the examples taken from literature and art, characterized by the loss of any interest in any activity that was once perceived pleasurable, powered self-destruction, contrast with the evolutionary style of mankind and of every living being. The development path of human collectivity, even if full of mistakes, is characterized by competitive strengths, which is oriented toward the future and toward the achievement of a goal. This applies to individuals and to groups. The expression of the feelings of discouragement and demoralization that we outline above are the results of abandonment, separation, and trauma. And in this respect, we can make a parallel with Adam and Eve, as described in the Genesis. The snake tempts the woman to eat a fruit from the tree by telling her that it will make her more like God, and it would not lead to death. After some thoughts about the fruit's beauty, the woman decides to eat it. She then gives the fruit to the man, who eats also. And God responds by cursing the snake above all animals, causing it to, to lose its legs and to become an eternal enemy of the human race. God then passes judgment for the disobedience of men and women, condemning the man to sustain life through hard labor and the woman to create new life through painful childbirth, and banishes them from the garden. The new dynamic psychology contrasts with traditional psychiatry and began to explore the profound feelings which are capable of introducing a trauma as a, as a reaction to the non fulfillment of a desire of a necessity. We believe that the trauma which originates from separation is developed only in a limited part of subjects already influenced by personal experience, but becomes more appropriately a collective phenomenon because solicited by culture. This is precisely what Pierluigi Pagani and Francesco Parenti have defined la protesta in, gri in grigio, the great protest, as a fruitless compensation of an individual, which in turn stops any action which would be more fruitful. Some remedies are nevertheless available to human beings as a treatment of this deadly illness. Firstly, interpersonal communication. Discouragement can be interpreted as a means to compensate the incommunicability which is described by Alberto Moravia. This is very effective, but dangerous at the same time. Therefore, the opportunities to communicate must be far from mistrust and fear, so that they do not constitute an inhibition. They should be based on solidarity. They should strike the right balance between behavioral norms and freedom of action. The second remedy to psychological inhibition is curiosity and spirit of discovery. This means making plans, having goals. A parallel here can be made with Tennyson Ulysses. Ulysses describes to an unspecified audience his discontent with his restlessness upon returning to his kingdom after fundraising travels. Facing all age, Ulysses yearned to explore again, despite his reunion with his wife and son. The character of Ulysses has been widely explored in literature, and he is depicted as an aggressive and heroic, admired for his determination to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. The third remedy is pleasure. In this respect, our definition of pleasure contrasts with those of Freudian theories. According to them, pleasure refers to sexuality, while we choose to define it in a much broader way. Pleasure is anything that pleases the senses. Clearly, sexuality is included in the definition, but also intellectual activity, aesthetic beauty, job satisfaction, affectivities, and all activities which do not imply any form of egoism or narcissism, but are emotionally shared with other people. The fourth remedy consists in mobility, which can be either psychic or physical. This means mental agility as opposed to automatism, enemies of creativity. In this context, also technology plays an important role. Nowadays, it would not be possible to think about a world where human beings are not capable of taking advantage of technological development. The last treatment against any trauma, separation, and depression is the art of entering into debate which not, with no aggressiveness or hate. This is clearly more easily said than done. Nevertheless, persuading is much more effective than punishing. We would like to conclude this analysis with an optimistic view, as suggested by Pierluigi Pagani and Francesco Parenti in the last chapter of the essay, Protesta in Grigio nella Verità della Depressione. Great protest in the labyrinth of depression. 
specifically the book dealt with the analysis of a colleague, a man in his early 50s who was working in the medical sector. This man was evoking his past and old memories and he suddenly turned sad when the word present was pronounced. This man was not able to take any advantage of any be benefit or positive thing of his ordinary life, culture, politics, entertainment, art, nothing. Everything for him was related to the past, not the present. Besides, soon we understood that it was what was interesting to him, the emancipation of his children and retirement. Nothing else. Everything has lost its significance to him. The only plan for the future was to not make any other plan. An opposite case was presented to us later on. An old painter who had just turned 80. He talked about his painting, the light, the color, the brushes he used and the twine, with boundless enthusiasm. And this endless attitude of making plans and plans and then plans again seems contagious. He was a man who struggled until the very last moment of his life to play the game which is life itself, with all the risks that are involved. These two cases clearly show two opposite attitudes to our life and are two examples of what we define as compensation. In psychology, compensation is a strategy whereby ones cover up consciously or unconsciously weaknesses, frustration, desire, feelings of inadequacy or incompetency in one area of life to the gratification or drive towards excellence in another area. Compensation can cover up either real or imagined deficiency and personal or physical inferiority. The compensation strategy, however, does not truly accept the source of this inferiority. Positive com compensation may help one to overcome one's difficulties. On the other hand, negative compensation do not, which result in a reinforced feeling of inferiority. A well-known example of failing compensation is observed in people going through a midlife crisis. Approaching midlife, many people, especially men, lack the energy to maintain their psychological defenses, including their compensatory acts. With the very last example of the painter, we intend to send a message to everybody, men, women, elderly people and children. Do not sit in the shade, don't inhibit your curiosity, don't break your wings, don't stop in your quest for knowledge. Life is a continuous journey, a continued discovery. This is an old, but at the same time, modern way to fight the great protest. First of all, to accept this ourselves and to use one's strengths to play in the best way the game of life. Questions such as death, the meaning of human existence, and the place or lack of God in that existence are among all of us. We can speculate on this concept, but this, these are not, there is not an answer. The only thing that is up to humanity is to grasp all the opportunities that life gives to us and to take the best out of them. Individuals have the honor and the duty to create value by affirming it and living it.